We're in part four, chapter two of the Derech Hashem. This is a fairly long chapter about the study of Torah. Well, Talmud, what he calls Talmud Torah. Um, you know something? I, I, I resisted my Yetzirah last time to tell you something. But this time I will tell you because I think there's, there's room for, for ambiguity or, or confusion. Talmud Torah. What would be the correct translation of the word Talmud? Study. So in context, of course, it sounds like study. But let's look at the grammar of Talmud. Um, you have Tanchum Avelim, comforting mourners. Now, the verb to comfort mourners is Lenachem, which is a peel. Tashlum. Tashlum schar, paying someone's uh, salary. Tashlum comes from Lishalem, which is a peel. <coughs> so if Tanchum comes from Lenachem, and Tashlum comes from Lishalem, Talmud should come from le la maid, which means to teach, not to learn, not to study, but to teach. And if you will look in the Rambam in Hilchos Talmud Torah, this is what he says: Everyone is obligated; a man is obligated to teach his son Torah. And not only his son, a man is obligated to teach his grandson Torah. And indeed, anyone who is knowledgeable is obligated to teach Torah to all students who want to learn. Teach, teach, teach. And then it says, someone whose father didn't teach him should. Now you think, well, what should he do? Well, I guess he's got to learn on his own. No, chayv lelamedes atzmo. He's chayv to teach himself. Which is a quotation from the Gemara. So you say, you know, like, why are you doing it that way? Obviously, if you're learning on your own, why call it teaching yourself? The answer is because the obligation is to teach. That's the obligation, is to teach. Who should you teach? Well, your son, your grandson, students. And if you're in the lurch because your father didn't teach you, then you teach yourself. That's the, the simple understanding of the word and um, based on the grammar. And then you could understand why in the Shulchan Aruch, Ramah says, let's suppose you have a person who can't, who can't learn Torah. He's uh, swamped by obligations which trump learning Torah, and there are many such obligations, and he's, he's swamped. So he could give money to others to learn, okay, that for everybody will agree, it's Pasha. But then he says, and by so doing, he also has a fulfillment of the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. You say, well, now, come on. If I can't put on tefillin, and I pay you to put on tefillin, did I put on tefillin? Did I get credit for putting on tefillin? Definitely not. So why would Talmud Torah be different? Because if the mitzvah of Talmud Torah is teaching Torah, that means the mitzvah of Talmud Torah is increasing Torah knowledge. And for yourself, it's increasing knowledge in yourself. Well, if you pay someone to learn, and because of your payment, he learns at a time when he couldn't otherwise have learned, he'd have had to have been earning that money. So then you are increasing Torah knowledge in the world. It's the same theme. So you understand where the Ramah is coming from. So I, I think, I, from the Rambam and from the Ramah, I think that the right way to explain the phrase Talmud Torah is Teaching Torah, yeah. Does it go also, Rabbi, you know, by matters of chesed? Like when you give things, you're only supposed to give it over to other people. So the Torah you give over, and like also the Daka also... Um, I, don't know, I would think so. I would think so. If you can't visit, visit somebody in the hospital, right. and you pay somebody to visit that person in the hospital, which you wouldn't otherwise have done, 
I think you are fulfilling a mitzvah chesed. Nice, nice question. Uh, I don't remember it explicitly, but um, yes, it sounds to me that that would be right. There is, um, I mean, there's, a, there's a deeper point here. Some mitzvahs are mitzvahs, maybe related to what you're saying, actually. When I was living in Baltimore about 83 years ago, no, it wasn't 83 years ago, I, I'm not that old. Um, there was a fellow there, what was his name? He was a businessman, but he gave very high level shiurim. And he once, he once described the difference between mitzvahs for which you could make a shaliach and mitzvahs for which you can't make a shaliach. And, the, and the, the difference is whether the mitzvah is to accomplish something or the mitzvah is to do an action. If the mitzvah is to accomplish something, you could send an agent on your behalf to accomplish it. If the mitzvah is to do an action, then, you, uh, then the, uh, his doing the action is not you doing the action. W one of the very striking examples is if you find a person out of town who's dead and you don't know why he died, and you have to establish which city is closest so that they should take responsibility for doing the process of rectifying his death, right? So you have to measure as a measuring process. Now, sometimes it's very obvious, you know. Uh, there's a, a settlement in the wilderness, and it's the only settlement for 100 miles, and this guy died 100 yards from that settlement. You have to measure. You have to measure. Measuring is not a way of finding out which settlement is closest. No. Measuring is a process of measuring. Then you can't make a shliach. You cannot make an agent to do it on your behalf because that's a process. If we're a question of... of um, if you have a process of discovery, then you could easily make a shliach. Now, for example, take tefillin. Here it's really tricky. I can't make a, 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 a shliach, an agent, to wear tefillin on my behalf, and that's if I'm wearing tefillin. But listen carefully. In tefillin, there are two parts. One is putting the tefillin on, and the other is who's going to wear them. When a normal person puts on tefillin, he does both. He puts tefillin on his own arm. But let's say that the person who, God forbid, is missing his right arm. His left arm is there to wear the tefillin, but he hasn't got the right arm to put it on. Well, the performance of putting it on is just accomplishing something, getting it on your arm. That you can make a shliach to do. You can make a shliach to put your tefillin on your left arm. But you can't make a shliach to wear the tefillin for you, because that's what's called a mitzvah shibagufo. That he has then certainly put it. He's got to put it on his arm. If he has no arms, he can't do it. Right? So the so the idea over here is that um, that there's a difference between so so th when you can make a shliach, that means that the whole mitzvah was a mitzvah to accomplish something. For example, kiddushin. Right? There's no mitzvah that you should hand the money to the woman. The mitzvah is to get married. So if you give money to somebody and say, go, you're my shliach, and you give her the money, I'll be married to her by your giving her the money, that's perfectly all right. Because the mitzvah there is to accomplish marriage, not to, to perform the maisa of, of handing it over. So these, the, this is the whole the difference between the two of them. So I think in chesed, in chesed, definitely, our responsibility is to get the comfort to the person. And then if you make a shliach, it will be count for you as a, as a maisa of chesed. I think you're exactly right about that. Yeah. Is there a word in the thing? Sure, little mold. So why didn't it say, why, why is there a specific mitzvah by Torah to teach yourself her as opposed to learn? So I, I think you're, you're adding f fuel to my fire. I think that's good. <laughs> because the, the, the noun could have been limud. Right. We actually talked about limud at Torah. So what's the difference in the meaning on both those things? Teaching yourself or learning? What's the difference... Oh, I don't know if there's a difference in be between teaching yourself and learning, but the question is, how do you conceptualize the action? <clears throat> how do you conceptualize the action? Well, I think that's the question. 
How do you conceptualize the action? Because if you think of learning detached, then you'd say, well, there's learning and teaching. Really, they're to two entirely different actions. They're not connected to one another whatso uh, whatsoever. The question is, what are you doing when you're learning? And if, if, you, if you subsume it under teaching, it might. Now you ask what the difference is. That's right. That's, that's, the, that's the Jewish question. Uh, it might make a difference. It might make a difference in what you learn and how you learn it. Because if the, the goal is to increase Torah knowledge, now let me think about this for a second. Now let me think about this for a second, because now there may be a much bigger enough community, and maybe this will turn out to show that what I'm going to say now is wrong. Um, okay, let me add something in here. What is the, the, the bracha that we make in the morning on, on the study of Torah? What bracha is that? It's la sok bedivrei sor. Commanded us to occupy ourselves with the words of Torah. Occupy ourselves. Now let me tell you something which is uh, famous for it when you make a siyum. In the long hadran, the long address that you make celebrating the siyum, one of the things you say is, we thank you for not having made us like people who waste their time sitting at street corners, gambling and doing other things. We are the, the denizens of the base medrash. We are the people who occupy the house of study. And then it sets up various contrasts between them and us. And one is, uh, they exert effort, and we exert effort. They exert effort and don't get a reward. We exert an effort and we do get a reward. So the Chavetz Chaim asked, excuse me, suppose he's a shoemaker. What do you mean he exerts an effort and doesn't get a reward? He makes shoes, he sells the shoes, and he gets paid for it. So the Chavetz Chaim explained as follows. Now, don't think of selling shoes the way they are today, where you have 400 boxes in one store and you can pick them out, you know, the style and the year and the make and, and how, many, how, many, <laughs> how many percentages of alcohol. <laughs> you know, no, there you went and they measured your foot and then he made a pair of shoes for you to fit your foot. Right. Okay, suppose he measures your foot and you come back after two weeks and you put on the shoes and they don't fit. Yeah, and you don't pay him. Right. He worked. He exerted effort, but he doesn't get paid. Okay, what's the parallel to that in learning Torah? You take out the Gemara, and you learn, you learn through the Gemara, and you lead through it, and you don't understand. And the answer is, even though you don't understand, you do get paid. Because the mitzvah wasn't to understand. The mitzvah was to spend your time occupied with the Torah. And at the end of the day, you throw up your hands and say, I don't get it, which happens. It happens to people at every stage of life. Right? You get credit for what you, your occupation of, with, of Torah the whole day. So now I'm beginning to think that the way I used to define it may be a mistake. It's not to increase Torah knowledge or Torah understanding. It's to increase occupation with Torah. So when we talk about teaching, teaching means the teacher is there, the students are there, they're occupied with Torah because he's teaching and they're responding. And if they succeed in creating knowledge, don't succeed in creating knowledge, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter. So, um, the nafkamina I was going to say to answer your question is not, it's not I don't think it's correct. Um, so, will there be any difference between conceptualizing it as teaching versus conceptualizing it as learning? It's a good question. I have to, I'll think about it more, but I'm thinking now that... If you understand yourself as a teacher teaching a pupil, you will, your performance will be very different from just struggling to understand. You will approach it with kindness, with sympathy, with uh, a responsibility to bring yourself along in, in a kind way, rather than simply trying to climb the mountain and berating yourself and so forth and so on, if you conceptualize it as teaching, the way teaching should be done, you may, it, the whole emotional tone may be different. But there more, more should be said about it. You got a question again? Yes, but I was just wondering, the Amelis in Torah, 
the um, how do you translate that? Struggle. It's struggle and effort, yeah. Effort and Torah, doesn't that eventually come to, um, you said no matter what, we get a reward for it, for just being occupied. That's right. So then, seemingly that what it means to gain knowledge in Torah is the fact that you're putting in effort. No, no. The, the, gaining knowledge is one thing, and putting in effort is something else. And the, the, the uh, great message in the, in the bracha is, that even if you don't end up getting knowledge, you get rewarded for your occupation with Torah. Mm -hmm. And having come all this way, I want to add something else. Uh, my first wife told me something which I think is very profound here. Let's imagine a person who's a businessman, mm -hmm. and he's writing a contract. And there's a clause in the contract, and he says, now wait a minute, is that permissible according to the Chosh Mishpat? The Shachon Aruch? Are we allowed to put that in the... Uh, is this pr appropriate? He calls up his Rav and he says, listen, I'm negotiating a contract and they want to put this clause in and I want to know, is it, it, does the Choshim Mishpat allow it or doesn't allow it? What is he doing? Isn't he occupying himself with Divrei Torah? He's trying to run his business according to Jewish law. Isn't that occupying himself with Torah? Who says occupying means sitting in front of a book? And if that's the way he runs his business all the time, if in the back of his mind is, yeah, but can I do this? We're advertising. Are we allowed to advertise this way? Is the advertisement true? Is the advertisement misleading? It can turn out that while he's sitting in his office and conducting his business, he's also occupied with Divrei Torah. She suggested that to me, and I asked several Torah scholars, and they agreed that the phraseology in the, Mishnah, in, in, the, in the bracha would include that as well. I think that's also a very profound, very profound idea. Now, what we're going to read in Ramchal here is, is much narrower than all of this. When he says, I mean, I think that the way he's understanding it is not the way I'm understanding it. So I'm just pointing out that he, he's going to have a different approach, a different slant altogether. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering if I had an idea of the difference between this is teaching yourself and learning. Like in, I don't know if it's fully clear, but teaching is usually a transfer from one person to another. So when you're teaching yourself, you're basically doing a shabbos of being part of Hashem teaching you that Torah. I mean, it's not coming from you alone. You're doing your shabbos, and Hashem is really the one who's transfer of Torah is coming from him, you. So you're a partner in that teaching of Torah, as opposed to just, when you learn something, it's I'm doing it. Okay, the idea of having a shem in the picture and being a partner with him and doing it, I'm not sure how it would work here. But I will tell you, there is there's a, case, there's a case of what you're talking about. Because when Akash Baruch Hu gave to Avram Avinu the mitzvah of Mila, circumcision, and he had to circumcise his children and all of the all the, of the servants of the house and himself. And the verb that's used for him and Yishmoel is the same verb. And that's quite interesting because in the case of Yishmoel, Avraham did it to Yishmoel. So it happened to Yishmoel. But when Avraham did it to himself, it didn't just that it happened to Abraham. He did it to himself. But the same verb is used there. And there are svarim that say that no one can circumcise himself. No one can perform a circumcision without a Kodesh Baruch Hu involved because you're inducting him into the covenant. No one can induct a person into the covenant. You can perform a surgical operation, but you can't do that. And therefore it says that when Abraham held the knife to circumcise himself, Kodesh Baruch Hu was also holding the knife. So there's your picture, but it's in a different context how to uh, implement your picture in the context of, of learning Torah, I don't know. But anyway, okay, so this is just background of the general idea. Now, as I told you yesterday, or the day before, before the President of the United States caused the traffic tie-up, um, the way he starts is that God put into the world certain energies, 
those energies are responsible for the existence of various things and the behavior of various things. And those energies are arranged in a hierarchy, which eventually comes down to our physical world, various pieces of our physical world, down to the point where angels are involved. And they say a blade of grass grows because an angel takes a stick and beats it and says, grow! And that's why it grows. All of this is tied to these, these energies. And there are various there are different types of energies. One is the energy that most portrays God's existence in our world. Now, um, that's, those are the words that he says. And I gave an analogy uh, two days ago to try to explain this concept. You know that empathy is something people work on. Let's say you're a psychologist. It would be quite useful to be able to empathize with the feelings of your uh, client to know where he's holding, what he's experiencing. That would give you an insight to be able to help him better. <clears throat> okay, let's say you're a psychologist who's treating drug addiction. I don't think that you want to learn what he's feeling like by going there. You don't want to get yourself addicted to drugs so as to be able to empathize with your clients who are you're trying to wean off drug addiction. But there are means of creating secondary experience. And these are found in the arts. Whether it's a well-done biography of a drug addict, or it is uh, a film about drug addiction, or even static art about drug addiction, one of the things that art does is to enable you to vicariously have the feelings of what the, the art portrays. So you get to feel some of a drug addict's feeling without being addicted. So that's like translating drug addiction to a person who isn't addicted, but translating it in such a way that he has some relationship to that reality. That's a rough, rough analogy or model for what he's saying here. Everything in our world is created. It's a creature. It's dependent for its existence on the creator. It's not the creator. It's not a piece of the creator or a slice of the creator or part of the creator or dimension of the creator. The gap between creator and creature is infinite. But some of the creatures express qualities that communicate something about the nature of the creator. And this highest energy, he says, does that. It's the, in, the, in the nature of the creation, this energy expresses within the created world something about what the creator's nature is. Okay, let me, let me just say two more words. I'm taking a question. Now he says, you have this created energy. That's step one. Then you have the Torah. That's step two. And step three is joining them together. Joining the energy together with the, the, the Torah so that by interacting with the Torah, you can have access to that energy. And the reason why he has that complex picture is because, I mean, the Ramchal is a philosopher. These things are all worked out. Because what he wants to say is this. The connection between the Torah and that energy means that by interacting with the Torah, you can access that energy and benefit from that energy and spread that energy. You can, but it's not necessary. It's not absolute. It's not built in. You have to fulfill certain initial conditions in order to qualify yourself by using the Torah to access that energy. But if you don't fulfill those conditions, then you won't. It's not necessary. That's what you get out of a description of the energy first, Torah second, and connection. It's not something intrinsic to the Torah. And I'm, I'm stressing that because he will tell us that there's something else which is intrinsic to the Torah, and that is necessary unless you, unless you blind yourself. So there, there, there are these two, two different levels, and the one is dependent upon certain preparations, and the other is not. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think I was going to ask, he said everything was created by Hashem, like everything has some kind of connection to Hashem that Hashem made. So some things are express more Hashem, and some things less. I think I learned that even inanimate ob objects, we should still have some kind of respect for because it's kind of like a creation 
of Hashem. So even if it's not an expression of Hashem, would you agree that we should have some kind of respect for what it is? Yes, I think that's, that's, that's perfectly correct. Let me repeat what you said for the, for the recording. He's asking, even if there are different gradations, I would say there are different gradations in expressing Hashem's exist, ex- existence, qualities, identity, character in the world, some more and some less, but everything is a creature, and therefore a certain amount of respect should be shown for everything because, simply because it is a creature that a Kodesh Baruch Hu creates. We have a rule called Baltashis. Baltashis means don't destroy things of value, anything of value. Don't destroy anything that has value. And one of the reasons for it is because, uh, because it is a, is a creature, whether it's a creature or a man-made thing, the man-made thing also has its existence supported by Kodesh Baruch Hu's will. Without it, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't continue to exist at all. Um, now, th- this expression of, of respect has, has levels. In other words, you're walking down the street. Must you check each step to make sure there are no bugs where you're going to stand? No, you don't have to do that. But a person who chases bugs to kill them, from our point of view, that's obscene. I just want you to know that an ant is trillions of times more complex than any computer. If I would ask a, uh, IBM to turn out a machine that can extract energy from the environment and can go through complex building processes and can join together with others of its own type to work on joint projects and, uh, and also can reproduce, can create other, uh, other of its own type, and they want all the programming to go into the head of a pin, I think IBM would say, you're dreaming. That's not going to happen. Certainly not in the next 100 years or 200 years. Well, but that's right. That's quite right. That's exactly what an ant is, and more. So um, to simply destroy them at will is, is, um, is gross, gross insensitivity to what they really are. So I think, I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Is Ram Chal going to explain better what the energy that's merging is comparing? No, no. He gives a, a general description of it that I've given you, and he doesn't say any more about it. What he talks about is what kind of interactions with the Torah will, will uh, access it. And, of course, it will be a sliding scale of access. But the, the, in this safer, he doesn't talk any more about it. Okay, so now he says, he put this energy, so to speak, it's connected to the Torah detail by detail. It's not just the ideas, it's the, it's the letters, even the letters. So that someone, and this is, the, this is a surprise, which I can't fully explain, but this is what he says, someone who reads the words without understanding, just pronounces the words, has some connection with that highest energy. That's why I said his usage of the title, Talmud Torah, is quite different from ours. We would not call pronouncing the words uh, learning Torah, uh, teaching Torah at all. And yet he does say that. And then, of course, the more you understand, the greater your interaction with that energy is, the more you bring it down, the more you can access it, the more you inf- influence it. But even reading it, now this is what's called Torah Shabbat Shav. This is what in his mind would be, I think, the Tanakh, the five books of Moses and the prophets and the writings, not the Talmud or the Mishnah or other things, so that is just a record of the oral tradition, and the oral tradition doesn't have this feature. The oral tradition is only a matter of understanding. It's not a matter of, um, of reciting. Even though people do learn the Mishnah by heart, it's a wonderful thing to do. But saying the Mishnah without understanding the words of the Mishnah doesn't get you access to this highest uh, energy. Uh, yeah, he says, it's obvious that the more understanding you have, the more interaction you will have. But, as a matter of fact, just reciting gets you an interaction. Yeah. So, so let's turn to the, 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 
connection that you uh, reach through reciting the words of the written Torah is, uh, so to speak, uh, higher than the experience of understanding the Torah Shebal Peh, or? No, no, no. It, 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 you need to understand in order to, uh, to, to, to get to, to experience that connection with, uh, with the oral Torah, and in the other one, just reciting it already gets you somehow that's right. That's right. The, the, with the written reciting, gets you some can, interconnection. With the oral tradition, it's only understand. Well, yeah, it's, yeah, according to him, it's understanding, right? And I'm not going with what I said before. It's, with, it's understanding. Um, but think, think for uh, for a moment. This is a tremendously, a tremendous democratization of of Torah, because almost everyone can learn to pronounce the words. So that means everyone will have a share in this. No matter what his intellectual capacity or achievement is, everyone will have a share. In a certain way, this includes what the Gemara refers to many times, Tinoko Shobes Rabban, which we usually take to mean small children who are studying Torah, or at least they're involved with Torah. They have a teacher and they're involved with Torah. There's certain hours that they're supposed to be involved and so on and so on. Even though... I should tell you, just for your general knowledge, the word tinok in our literature could refer to someone over the age of our mitzvah. Tinok doesn't have to be a four-year-old. Mm. But in this case, it certainly does include children who are minors. And the question is, how does their involvement with Torah create any positive effect? According to the Ramchal, it works out very well. Because just reciting the words will have that effect. And when they start learning, they start learning Torah Peh. Torah Shabbat I'm sorry. Um, if you did it the way the Mishnah was said, you would start learning at five, and from five to ten, you would spend it only on Tanakh. And then from ten to fifteen, only on Mishnah. And after that, you would start Talmud. So you would spend five years in the Zilberman clan over here in the old city. They instituted such a system doing it the way the Gemara says. Um, these kids, you have an eight-year-old studying the book of Job or the poetry of Isaiah or the Aramaic, uh, uh, you know, in um, Nehemiah and, and, and Ezra. And, and they know it. I have grandchildren who went through the system. I have children who taught in the system and grandchildren that went through the system. And you start a verse, and they can finish it. And they can tell you what it means. And you ask them, where are these and these verbs used? They can rattle off in the, in the first book of, of uh, in, in the 16th chapter of Genesis and the 24th chapter of, of Exodus. And they, they, they have it right in front of them. And it's really astounding what, what they're able to achieve. So, but if they start just reciting the words at the age of five, where well, they don't understand necessarily what, they, what they're saying, but that, according to Ramchal, they are involved in Torah in such a way as to access that energy. And then the, the Talmud can say, I didn't realize this before, but I'm just realizing it now. The Talmud could say that because of what their involvement, the whole world gets a certain benefit. Yeah. So just like reading the Pesukim would lead you to a higher power, you can say also that talking to Hashem would, you, would lead you to a higher source also, no? Not this higher source. This higher source is attached only to the Torah. The only access you have for this higher energy is through the Torah. There are many different types of energy. And he says the, the uniqueness of this type of energy is that it's attached to the Torah, and the Torah is the only access you can have to it. That's why this chapter is the chapter of Talmud Torah. Right. Yeah. So does this apply to tefillah as well? So if a person doesn't understand necessarily the tefillah in Hebrew, but they're davening in Hebrew, would we say that's a higher level of davening than if he would be saying all of Shemona in English? Okay, you're asking about prayer and asking the same question. And um, you asked it very well. You didn't mention specifically this higher power. You just asked whether saying the, the prayer in Hebrew without understanding it, and how should we compare that with saying the, the, Shema, the, the Shemona Esri in English, where you do understand, but it's not Hebrew. And this is actually discussed. This is discussed in this forum. And uh, although they don't make a strict comparison of this type, but there's no question that if you say the words of prayer in Hebrew without understanding them, you have fulfilled the mitzvah of prayer. 
So that you're right to mention it's an, another application of this idea that just saying the words. Now the idea there is that the words in Hebrew are constructed in such a way as to unlock certain locks in the spiritual background of the world. And when you unlock those locks, a certain flows are created. But you have to know, now this, this is crucial, you have to know you're standing before God. If you think you're just tra- practicing your Hebrew pronunciation, it won't work. In fact, knowing that you're standing before God is the definition of prayer. All the rest of it is uh, aspects and dimensions and additions and en- enrichments and, uh, and applications. But if you lose fa- track of the fact that you're standing before God, it's over. There's nothing left. So that's, uh, that's absolutely crucial. But indeed, um, now I, I usually say the question which is greater, A or B, is relevant only when you have to choose. But in the case of prayer, there's absolutely no reason why you should have to choose. Because with a simple uh, uh, technique, in a couple of months, you can be saying the whole Shemana Esrei and understanding it. So there's no reason to have to choose. And here's what you do. You take a, a, a sitter that's Hebrew on one side and English on the other side, and then over each Hebrew word, you write the English translation. So when you're looking at the Hebrew, you're seeing the English also. Now, um, interlinear. Like you make, but you make your own interlinear, right? If you have it with interlinear and you, or you underline them or something, the idea is to look at the Hebrew and see the English and, and understand what it is. Uh, and by the way, since there are lots of words that repeat a lot, there's a lot of boruchs there. Right? If you get used to what boruch is, you've already, get, you've already gotten yourself 25 applications. If you do that, within a, a month or, le- or less, you'll be, you'll be understanding the whole, the whole Shema Nesri. And yes, you can write in the sitter. Perfectly permissible to write in the sitter. No problem. Pencil, in ink, no question, no problem about it whatsoever. And you can write in Sforim altogether. People wrote, kept the notes of what they, what they wrote in the Sforim. So you should set yourself this kind of process, and in a short period of time, you'll have both. You won't need to be wondering which is one or the other. You're not stuck in making a decision for one or the other and losing the other half. No, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not true. Yeah? Did you say that it was specific about uh, children learning? Is that since you're taking out the equation of the possibility of not understanding, that's removed. So the whole time they're learning, it's maybe not missing anything. They're always no, the, the, the myla of children learning is that they have no averus. They're spiritually pure. That's, that, that's what the verse says. So it's not a question of what they say, what they don't say, and understanding, not understanding. The question, the point is that their occup, occupation with Torah is pure, because they're, they're spiritual pure. Okay, so now let's see if we can get this a, a peek at the conditions that are necessary here. Um, So he says, the, the conditions that are necessary to accompany your Talmud Torah so that you'll be able to access that highest energy are, one, Yira in the process itself and the appropriate uh, context of action that you perform in your life in general. Now, the word year in Hebrew has two connotations. One is fear, the way fear means in English, and the other is awe. Sometimes it means one, sometimes it means the other, and sometimes it means both. There is a word in Hebrew for pure, what you would feel when you were told to cross Times Square blindfolded, you know, and and you're expecting it to die at any moment. That word in Hebrew is pachad. So when when a text uses the word yira, You can't translate it just as fear. It's a combination of fear and awe. And he says that's one of the preconditions. When you're involving yourself in Torah, you have to have that fear and awe. Now you say, don't you have to have that all the time? Yes. Yes, you do. But there's a general background of fear and awe. And then there are the particular circumstances 
in which you are involved, which particular mitzvah that you are involved, and that's um, that adds to the to it and focuses it in a specific way that doesn't apply to every other every other um, mitzvah. So imagine that you are part of a court hearing a capital case, analyzing the uh, the evidence, and then having to vote whether the person should live or die. I think that your sense of fear and awe would be very heightened and very focused in a way that it wouldn't be when you're washing your hands. Washing your hands is also a mitzvah. Every mitzvah should be done with fear and awe. But it's not like deciding whether a certain person should live or die. So you have to understand that in the case of the study of Torah, there's a special element, special dimension of fear and awe that has to be, has to be applied. And um, that's what he starts to describe. He says, I told you already that in this process, you are accessing this highest energy, the highest creature that represents Akonjbaruchu's presence in the world and, rep- and gives some kind of depiction of his nature. Well, I'll give you just an analogy. Um, Let's imagine that you're, you're, um, you're, you're going to on a on a on a, on a, 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 a ambassadorship for the king, and a certain thing has to be negotiated with the foreign government. And you're the chosen ambassador, and the king says, for the sake of this project, you can wear my crown. That's not keeping your head cold from the wind. You're wearing the royal crown. How would you feel? When you're acting, roaring the world, you're representing the king. They look at you and they see the king. Wouldn't you be very careful about what you said? Very careful about what you did? How you conducted yourself? You wouldn't conduct yourself with that kind of care ordinarily. Here he's telling you that this instrument, the Torah that you're learning, this instrument gives you access to the creature that most represents a Kodesh Baruch Hu in the world. So it's not like just doing any other mitzvah. It's a mitzvah which puts you in contact with that highest energy. The very fact that you know that makes you especially filled with fear and awe. And if you aren't, then it means you don't know what you're doing. You don't realize what it is you're interacting with. If the king gives you his crown and he says, you know, you should wear this, you say, does it have ear flaps to keep my ears warm? (laughs) <laughs> you know. How does it fit? Let's see. Well, it's fit. Maybe I should get some other hat instead of this hat. You've missed it. This is the crown of the king. So if you don't know what you, that what, I'm sorry, if you do realize what you're dealing with, then you should be filled with fear at all because of the instrument that you're using. And that being the case, um, if you don't have that fear at all, it means you don't. You're not registering what you're using. And if you're not registering what you're using, then it's not, it's not going to have that effect. It has that effect because of your conscious understanding and dedication to the consequence of having an effect on that highest energy. And that will, that's what will produce the fear at all. So that's, you know, that's, that's a condition for, for, for the action to have that, that effect. That's one of the conditions. The other is, is a ma- proper amount of... of Compliance with with the mitzvah of the Torah. I'll talk about that next time, musician.